Alternate Focus joins Sabil, a voice of Palestinian Christians, to present Dr. Mark Braverman, a Jewish American with deep family roots in the Holy Land, author of Fatal Embrace, and executive director of Tent of Nations North America. The following excerpts were taken from Dr. Braverman's talk at St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle, Washington, on February 20th, 2010. It is so wonderful to be in Seattle, and it is so wonderful to be in the bosom of, uh, of Sabil. Um, the purpose of today is really to take a lot of what we have been learning over the years and to start to really focus on what to do now and what's next. And this is an American issue. It's an American issue. It's a domestic issue as an issue, as an issue of justice. And politics have failed, and what we are witnessing here and what we are part of is the birth and the growth of a movement. That's what we're doing here. The peace process, as we all know, the so-called peace process, never really existed, and it is a, if it had been, if it did exist, it's a, it's a failure. It's the movement that will bring about peace, and it's a movement that is much more, much, uh, more akin to the movement that brought about the end to Jim Crow here in this country, and that brought about the end of apartheid South Africa and in many ways much less like the so-called peace process than the work of the Old Testament prophets and the work of Jesus. And the reason that I'm here is to talk about what I consider to be a critical piece of that movement, where that movement needs to live, where the energy needs to come from, and what I consider one of the major barriers to that happening. And my discovery about that, what that barrier is, and also what part of the answer to what will give the movement power and strength and ultimately success is, has come from my own personal journey. I was born here in this country. My grandfather actually was born in Jerusalem. So I talk about being a Palestinian Jew, but in fact, I'm a second generation American. And if you're an American Jew born in this country in 1948, you are raised in a religion which is um, Zionism. It wasn't that way before 48. Lots of Jews were not Zionists, thought it was a terrible idea, political Zionism. But after 48, there was a train, and you really had to be on it. Um, so I was raised as a Zionist. My grandfather had left the Holy Land. His ticket to America was an arranged marriage, but it sort of made him the black sheep of the family. At the age of 17, when I returned to Jerusalem um, as part of a synagogue trip, um, I was sort of the prodigal son, and I looked real good to them. And it was wonderful. It was a wonderful reunion. I felt like I had come home, and in fact, I had. But several things were happening. There were some seeds that were being planted. I recall sitting um, with my aunt um, and cousins and uncle in a religious settlement um, near the Mediterranean and uh, speaking Hebrew, and it was just wonderful. I was deeply, deeply in love with the whole, with everything, including the family. And they started to talk about the Arabs, as they called them. Now, I had grown up in Philadelphia in the early 60s. I knew racism when I heard it. And I said to myself, what is this? And what's going, you know, there's a problem. I came back after college, lived on a kibbutz in the Galilee, and uh, ignored what were clearly the remnants of what I thought must have been an ancient civilization, because that kibbutz was built on the ruins of a cleansed village that, in fact, had been the scene of a massacre, of an atrocity. 18 women and children killed by the Haganah, just to make the point, to make sure that the rest of the uh, Palestinians up in the Upper Galilee would, would get out and go to Lebanon and end up in camps. I ignored that. It must have been an ancient civilization. I found myself that year, I was 22 years old, sitting in a, I don't know exactly how it happened, but sitting in a Palestinian home nearby with some folks who had been internal, were internal uh, displaced people from a nearby village, telling me that they had been told to get out of their village in 48, but that they would be able to come back 
were never allowed back, but as happened with many of those folks, came, went back time and time again until, as they put it, Golda dynamited our village. Golda? My Golda? Is a war criminal? What is this? Seeds were planted. I will just, I will just say that. I went back home. Life happened. Uh, the seeds finally sprouted when I was close to 60 years old, not too long ago. And I went back to Palestine with the Fellowship of Reconciliation with an interfaith group and saw the occupation and was torn apart, was really devastated. Uh, I really didn't know what to do about it. I found myself more comfortable in East Jerusalem with the Palestinians and in West Jerusalem with my people. And I thought, what does this mean? What does this mean? Who am I? Um, we went to see Yad Vashem. We went to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, which I had been to years before, but this was the new improved version if you've been there recently. Um, as you approach the museum from the parking lot, you pass under a huge archway inscribed with the words of the prophet Ezekiel from the famous vision of the dry bones. You know it well, Ezekiel 37. And here's what it says in Hebrew and in English. I will put my breath into you, and you shall live again, and I will set you upon your own soil. This is the archway as you enter the Holocaust Museum in Israel. Contemplating this inscription, I was rooted to the spot. We had been in Jerusalem in the West Bank for four days. I was bursting with outrage at what I had seen. I was not feeling close to the redemptive Zionist dream. Then you enter the museum. I stood before a huge wall on which is projected a movie depicting the lost world of the Jews of Eastern Europe. Moving before me across a map of Russia, Poland, and Germany was a stunning, heartbreaking photographic record of the world that had been lost. Artisans, musicians, laborers, teachers, villages, houses of study, children, all gone. The movie ended with a photograph of a choir of Jewish children somewhere in Europe, and on the soundtrack, they are singing Hatikva. I was shattered. A hand had reached into me, grabbed hold of my heart, drawn me back into my past, into the collective memory of my people. How could I turn my back on this? How could I walk away from my history, from this incalculable, unfathomable loss, and more so from Israel, my deliverance? And then it hit me. This was no mere museum. This was a lesson. This was indoctrination from the biblical quote at the entrance into the depths and to this site of the land, our reward, our destiny. I really was in pieces. Uh, it took a while to start to put this back together again and to figure out who I was and how I was supposed to be a Jew. And it was really Sabil and Naim Atik that helped me do that. Uh, I went home uh, from Sabil and had a copy of Justice Only Justice in my hand. And, uh, and I read it. And there it all was. There were the prophets, direct line to Jesus. It's about justice, and it didn't happen overnight, but eventually I realized that this was what I was supposed to do. This was the way for me to be a Jew. In fact, it was the only way. We went to, uh, we went to Sabil, and we spent an hour with Nora Carmi, who works for Naeem, and uh, I asked her, Nora, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with the fact that you know, your children are leaving and, and you're dispossessed and you can't go back to your home? And she said, look, we follow Jesus. Who was Jesus? 
Jesus was a Palestinian Jew living under Roman occupation. How did he deal with that? What did he teach us? That's what we do. We are here. We resist. That's our faith. And it's a faith, as the Kairos document says, grounded in love. And I started to learn what it meant to love your enemies. So I come to Israel and I discover faith. I come home with two questions. The first question is, why is my people doing this? The second question, when I start to talk about this, and I start to talk to a lot of Christians, because I can't really talk to too many Jews. The Jews who agree with me, I don't need to talk to. The Jews who don't agree with me, I can't talk to, because they don't listen. I'm talking to a lot of Christians, and then the question is, the second question is, why are you helping us do it? I discover the deep and wide social justice agenda of the churches here, of Christianity here. I didn't know about that. You know, as a kid, I was not supposed to, I didn't know anything about Christianity. I wasn't even supposed to step into a church. In fact, if I walked by a church, I was almost always supposed to maybe cross the street. We weren't supposed to come close because you were going to kill us or you were going to convert us. And it wasn't clear what was worse. And so now I'm in churches and I'm finding out, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. So that was the first thing I discovered. The second thing I discovered was Christians knew how to love the Palestinian people, but they did not know how to love the Jewish people. And that was the conflict. That was the problem. So when a Jew says, I'm here to tell you that what you already know is right, is in fact right, and we really need you to do this, if you really want to love us, here's how to love us, what I discovered was a, a very, very deep hunger for that message. Okay, so why is it such a problem for Christians? 65 years ago, the Christian world stood before the ovens of Auschwitz and said, what have we done? And Hitler only had to tap in to what was already there, and it was ready. And Christians, rightly so, and accurately said, there's something wrong in our theology. Something happened in our history that created this anti-Jewish doctrine, deep, ugly, and we've sinned, we've done wrong, and we have to fix it. And so what ensued was a project to reconcile with the Jewish people that consisted of revising Christian theology to really turn that part of the doctrine around and really reverse it and really expunge it. And so, but what's happened is that displacement theology, which says that Christianity has come as the new Israel and has displaced the Jews, that's the old law. And in fact, the Jews, because they killed our Lord and rejected, and, and then on top of that, then rejected his message are doomed to wander the earth, and that's evidence of God's punishment. Uh, so the Jews were reinstated as God's elect. And the original covenant between God and Israel, in its original form, the whole deal, progeny, wealth, land, is reinstated. It's in force. Generations of theologians and clergy have been educated in this new theology. But there's a problem with it, isn't there? There's a problem with it. It's, the problem is that it's a slippery slope to an endorsement of Zionism. I mean, the deal is, this is how I sort of put it, you killed our Lord, so then we killed you. That was wrong, and we're really sorry, so you can have the temple back. That's the deal. Now, there was Christian Zionism I mean, there was Zionism embedded in Christianity from further back than that, before the Holocaust. It goes further back. But this is kind of new, and it's really hiding in plain sight in mainstream Christianity. I am much more concerned about what's going on in, you know, First Presbyterian and Topeka than I am about John Hagee and Kufi and, 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 the, and the raptured dispensationalist people, because that can be sort of discounted as kind of a fringe thing. This, this is in the mainstream but it's just as powerful, and I'm more, I'm more concerned about it. 
Recently, I read an article by a fellow named John Palakowski, who is a uh, Catholic priest, and he said, the Vatican's 1993 recognition of the state of Israel is pivotal in correcting the anti-Judaism of Christian theology. With that act, the coffin on displacement, perpetual wandering theology has been finally sealed. Now, I find this an astonishing argument. Consider, recognizing the state of Israel fixes what's wrong with Christian theology. Now, not that this particular aspect of Christian theology didn't need fixing, but um, consider the implications. It's not just that the Jews are OK. Yeah. It's that we deserve the state of Israel. Uh, I was just sitting in, in Naim's um, uh, workshop talking about Jonah, and somebody made the remark, and it's very, very true, and I'll repeat it uh, again, is that Christian triumphalism has now been replaced by Jewish triumphalism. That's the way Christianity resolved the trauma of the Holocaust. I mean, what could have happened, what should have happened was, let's take a look at ourselves. What have we done wrong? But instead, let's just be really, really nice to the Jewish people. Let's give them a guilt offering, and then we'll be OK. But what's happened is then, really, then Christianity can hitch a ride on the new Jewish triumphalism, and we can all be the elect together. It's not OK. And we can see the result of that. There's more. In this article, he goes on and he says, uh, we have sinned in spiritualizing the land, we, Christians. Because when we spiritualize the land and said it's not about a particular mountain or a particular mountaintop or a temple, but it's, it's the whole world, God lives everywhere in all of us. You know, Jesus said, these stones will come down and I will rebuild it in three days and my body is the temple. I know what he means by that. He means that we are all one body. God lives in all of us. No more temple. That was really important. Not that Christianity didn't go ahead and break its own rules and turn the land into an object and commit idolatry on the land and, 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 and go and conquer it, etc. But if it was wrong for the Christians, it's wrong for the Jews. So the point is, Christian triumphalism has been uh, replaced by Jewish triumphalism. The Christian desire for reconciliation with the Jewish people has morphed into support for a racist, anachronistic ideology and political program that has hijacked Judaism, put the continued existence of Christians in the Holy Land at risk, continues to fuel global conflict, and basically has produced one of the most egregious, long-standing violations of human rights in the world today. So this is really about theology. And if we don't confront the theology, we're not going to be able to fix this. Now, there's another reason, and that is Christians talk about the need to honor the deep Jewish commitment to the land. But as a Jew, I have to consider the distinction between loving a land and claiming it as my identity and my birthright. When you claim a superior right to a territory that's shared by, with others, whether that claim is made on religious grounds or political grounds, you head straight for disaster, which is exactly where the Jewish people are headed today. Don't confuse reconciling with the Jewish people with the movement and the cause for justice in the Holy Land. They're very, very different projects, and it's totally confused today. If what we do or what we say can even be perceived as anti-Semitic, we have to back off. We can't do it. It will disrupt the relationships that we've tried to build, and it's not Christian. Well, I think we know what's Christian. And it does not mean supporting the Jews in doing something that's not Jewish. What does the Bible mean by, quote, promised land? How has the term been hijacked and used for various political reasons when maybe that is not the significance of the texts at all? Ancient Israel is often confused with modern Israel. They are not the same. 
The Jewish people and the modern state of Israel, though they overlap in certain ways, are not the same, and therefore we have to be thoughtful and self-critical about how that theme is dealt with. Now we're starting to understand Jesus in his historical context, and it bears an eerie similarity to what is going on now today in Palestine, because you have global empire. I read a book recently that talks that has United States slash Israel as kind of a, 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 you know, a single entity. Um, basically trying to colonize and take apart an indigenous society and an indigenous population. And you've even got a client government installed in Ramallah. Just like Rome had a Jewish client government installed in Jerusalem. It's the same scenario. If you go to walk where Jesus walked today, not only will you walk where he walked, but you will see what he saw you will see empire attempting to destroy a society, sickening people, taking apart communities, stealing land through taxes and military actions, uh, uh, driving farmers off their land, interfering with people's access to practice their own religion. It's all there. And if you go there and you see it, you will, you will, you know, you will know you will experience Jesus because Jesus will say, what do you do when you see evil? You drive the evil spirits out. That's what we need to do. The church is right at home here, or should be right at home here. That's the social justice agenda of the American church. Domestic mission, global mission, church knows what to do. Except for the interfaith issue. That makes it difficult. I know. I know what charges you open yourselves up to when you dare to criticize the state of Israel or even bring it up. Don't allow yourselves to be held captive to the struggle that the Jewish people is going through now. You don't need the Jewish people to come along with you on this. This is, this is an American issue. It's a Christian issue. It's a faith issue. Um, there are clear rules, unwritten rules, that are observed when Jews and Christians get together to talk about interfaith, and one of them is that Israel and Palestine is off the table. I think it's time to change those rules. We need to stop thinking about interfaith dialogue and start to think about interfaith communion. Communion exactly in the Christian sense of the word. Everybody part of one body, devoted to justice, devoted to social justice, devoted to understanding what God wants of us, and we know what that is. And where was the energy for the civil rights movement in this country? Where was the leadership, and where was the energy, and where did the movement live in South Africa? What was the arena where that got played out, and where was the leadership from? And we know this. The judgment of God is upon the church, this is 1965, 63, is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club. You know, we don't have time. It's urgent. I heard Ilan Pape, who wrote The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, read the book, and he said, um, at a conference that I attended last year, he said, it's urgent. He said, because look at Gaza. It's previews of coming attractions. And he used the G word. He said, it's genocide. It's urgent. We don't have time.